All right, welcome to the new year and another Anglican Unscripted episode 709. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is January 7th, 2021 at 22. All right, welcome to the new year. And I'm going to start off the new year by reminding you your responsibility as a viewer to the show. And that's to like us. Please like us on Facebook and YouTube. Share this program with your friends, family, and foe. Subscribe if you're not subscribed yet and go to the comment section. Everything after the show, after I click publish, happens in the comment section. If by chance George and I are wrong, it happens like once a year, you will find out about that first in the comment section. If you want to add your own opinion or update the stories, you do that in the comment section. If you've got nothing better to do than troll, don't go to our comment section, go somewhere else. Okay, <laughs> we, we have remained pretty troll free for a while. We really appreciate that. You guys are the best commenters and you guys help add context and textures to our stories that we do here twice a week, usually on Tuesday and Friday on Anglican Unscripted. George, this is our first show of the year. We just uh, did our last show December 31st. We made it to 2022. Wow, what a year, huh? Absolutely. We had a vestry meeting on Wednesday this week, past week, and we're laying out the plans for the coming year. And we are all in agreement that we cannot continue what we were doing up through COVID, that there's a new world out there. And so we're going to be adding services uh, off-site. I'm gonna, we're going to start a mission in Homosassa. Homosassa is the town to the south of us, and we're going to draw people from Wikiwachi, uh, uh, Homosassa, Chaskahowitza, uh, the southern part of the county. Um, we get about, we have about 20 odd families from there, but only four or five have been coming back because it's a half hour, 40 minute drive. It's a drive. And so we're going to go to them. Uh, maybe Saturday night, maybe Sunday night, but we're going to go to them. And we basically are keeping the worship services that we have the same but we're going to be adding some services of different styles and adding services off-site basically to go where the customers are um we cannot just assume that just because we're the big church on the hill with the pretty sign and the pretty steeple we'll get people to stop in we've got to reach people where they are and so we're probably going to meet the, the volunteer fire station on Sunday afternoons in little little seaside town uh, in Florida, further down the road. So well, that, that's big a, plans for the future. That's the interesting part of Florida. Florida <clears throat> is, I would call, a seasonal place. Uh, you get a lot of snowbirds. People from the north come down here in the summer. And so the churches during the summer, are, are, they come here during the winter because they don't want to suffer through the winters of the north. But the churches here are most packed between uh, October and April, and then uh, the people November to May. November to May. Okay, I've I've only been here a short time. November to May, and uh, uh, then they go back up north and uh, attend the churches up there. You have that little window of six to seven uh, months to really work with them, and but then they're gone. How how does that really affect a church? Well, for us, it means that in February, we'll have twice the number of people that we have in August. And what the, what COVID did was that it kept the people who were traveling locked up in Canada, in the North, in New England, in the Chicago suburbs. People weren't traveling. Uh, people couldn't travel. And so we went through a period of it, of having our seasonal people not here. And meanwhile we're not really able to go out and do the sort of evangelism and uh, outreach we've had before so we basically had only walk-in traffic uh to offset the natural attrition of deaths and people moving away and moving into back up north or job transfers mm -hmm. so we really had to rethink what it looks like to be a church and so that means that we're going to basically polish up and do fa uh, Facebook and YouTube live services, as well as the recorded uh, morning and evening prayer 365 days a year. We're going to be doing things more live. But that's not enough, because live worship 
I don't think it, my opinion is not real worship. I think you really need to be there and present. Yeah, I would say it's not the same. Yeah, real, and, real or not, it's not the same. You know. Well, yeah. real, tangible for me. Yes. Um, uh, I, I do not wish to judge how other people receive that worship experience, but for me, it's not sufficient. And it, it's there's an imperative I feel, and I know the members of our congregation feel that we really need to get out and share the good news of Jesus Christ. The problems we're facing in this community are real. A lot of retirees, one of the old, Kevin lives in the second oldest county in Florida. We live in the third oldest county in terms of age. And that means people are on fixed incomes or on pensions, retirements, living on savings. And when they're seeing seven, eight, ten percent inflation, uh, they get scared. They do because they've got they've got their money laid out for the rest of their lives and oops i'm going to be living five years longer than the cash will be there um here in Sutton we've, County, we've, well i want to give you that example uh there's a united methodist church here in webster and in that church on monday they serve uh bags of groceries to 300 people a hundred cars drive through to get bags of groceries because these people are impoverished down here and COVID has made whatever poverty they had much, much worse. And it's made mm. some people in the middle class and lower class impoverished. And, you know, the people in my RV village here at the uh, Florida Grand, we give uh, our food stuff and we give money and stuff to keep Webster going because there's so many people in a town of 72 <laughs> 73 to have you know 300 of them uh, uh needing groceries once a week it's 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 hard to see and we, we want to be part of that to give you ministry the losers the losers in the economy around here and i would say it's the same for webster are small businessmen and women sure the self-employed the self-employed and um if you have a government job you're taken care of if you work for a giant Fortune 500 company, you're taken care of. We don't have many of those, if any of those, around here. Um, we have lots of independent, uh, self-employed uh, tradesmen, uh, construction trades, medical people, and it's very hard. And then, and so people are frightened. And and when people are frightened, they sort of retreat into their homes into their into what seems safe and what we're trying to do is to reach out to say this church is a safe place for you that you won't be judged you'll be loved you'll be brought on a journey to wholeness through jesus christ um christ is the medicine uh i think this sick society needs well now the, the society is sick on two different levels we're certainly secular sick but uh we're suffering from uh the coronavirus still and now uh 2022 deja vu they're still doing major lockdowns because of omicron uh around the world it's affecting the episcopal church certainly it's affecting mainland churches i read about uh, canada closing down again uh doing total lockdowns to the end of january um that doesn't help the mentality of the average person uh and especially the average uh, church goer. how do i go to church in the time of omicron george well, what we do is we have drive-up communion. We have another service where you we have a little portico uh, where you can drive up uh, and get out of your car, be undercover. And what we offer communion to people who drive up in their cars because we do have a number of people who are fearful of coming into a church with other people uh, during this time of sickness. But I, I will never close again. And I will not compel people to come to church and say you're a bad person if you don't come to church not at all mm -hmm. but for that one person who needs the gospel who needs that tangible presence of of me and or the other worshipers we're going to be there and i guess that's the line in the sand i'm drawing i'll put up with all the pettifogging nonsense from the diocese about you know wear masks this week but not next week gloves and all this you know that's fine I'll I'll go through all those silly inconveniences. They're not silly for the diocese, but I find them irksome. But I will never shut my doors again. That was a major mistake. And it was a mistake not because of pride or ego or anything, 
but because I saw what it did to those who needed the presence of Christ in the community and worship. And that, well, there's a viral video going around by a man named Church of England preacher, Will per Pearson, William Pearson Gee, hyphenated name. Mm -hmm. I think he's the rector of the church in Buckingham. I think it's Buckingham in England where he basically says, you know, this is the this is the ditch I'm going to die in. We're not, we are an essential service. We are not an optional extra uh, that you can just turn off and turn on. We're not a movie theater. We're not a, a restaurant. Public, we're not a, a box. Library. We're not the public library. Public library. Yeah. We are, uh, we are where you basically gather to worship the living Lord Jesus Christ, and that's not optional. Yeah. And I, I think it was a powerful thing to say because the atmosphere is worse in England. England is more autocratic, uh, certainly than Florida, mm -hmm. uh, but the and the church has been less. Actually, the church has been the hierarchy has been a disgrace over COVID in the Church of England. Um, and I guess here in America, we did very well without bishops from uh, 1620 all the way up to uh, 1789. Thank you very much. Episcopal Church was just fine. Thank you. Because the bishop was in London. Yeah. He never came. We never bothered. We sent him a letter once a year. That's how we Americans like our bishops across the ocean, far away. Uh, England, you get them a little too more closer, uh, but they're just as disinterested as you are in, in as as they were in us in America. But well, I can't no, do that again. No, but there's lots of Church of England Bishop news now uh, in the Church of Wales, too. Um, so we need to talk about it. Uh, Justin Welby has appointed a partnered gay person to be his assistant. And um, I think we need to talk about that in the realm of the Church of England, in the realm of the Anglican Communion, and the realm of the upcoming Lambeth uh, meeting. So let's talk. Give us the news, George. Well, it was announced yesterday by Lambeth Palace that Stephen Knott, the Archbishop's deputy uh, secretary, mm -hmm. had been appointed the appointments secretary for the Archbishops of Canterbury and York. This is a very powerful, influential position. This is the person who basically selects and hires the bishops of the Church of England. Mm -hmm. Under his, under his predecessor, Caroline Boddington, the Church of England actively promoted women bishops, discriminated against conservative evangelicals and Anglo-Catholics, made a mockery of the promises made that there would be no, that uh, the mutual doors flourishing. would remain open. M mutual mutual flourishing, flourishing was wiped out. Under Boddington, Boddington uh, was notorious. Uh, her husband was a bishop, and she was notorious for basically... Uh, head-hunting women clergy she wanted to be bishops once the time came before all this even happened she was preparing them and now for every male you get a female uh, bishop that's how it's working out but none of these people are uh, oh, well I don't want to say none of these people are competent but we're working on a story about Libby Lane the Bishop of Derby I, we apologize we pronounced it Derby like the hat or the Kentucky race, but it's Darby, Darby yeah. uh, spelled with an E, Libby Lane, who is in the middle of destroying the lives of one of her clergy. Um, and she's just grossly incompetent as a manager and this and that, but she ticks all the right boxes. So now Stephen Knott, a partnered gay man, who his behavior has indicated is an activist on this issue is now the Archbishop's appointment secretary. <clears throat> so are we going to face a situation where, whereas Carolyn Boddington basically shuffled the deck and stacked the cards for women bishops before it was uh, permittable, are we going to see Stephen not do that with gay bishops? Mm -hmm. Now, let, let me go into some background. Stephen Knott had a very public marriage to uh, a British Army General, Alistair, I want to say Bruce, or, uh, but I don't remember his last name. I'm sorry. On Anglican Inc., you can look at the pictures. He went, he and Alistair went up to Scotland and were married by the Bishop of Edinburgh. B 
because the Scottish Episcopal Church permits gay marriage. It is not permitted by the Church of England. So here we have a senior official of the Church of England acting against the rules of the Church of England and establish, establishing, if you will, facts on the ground by, if you will, leveraging the Scottish Episcopal Church's actions. Luke Appleton, who's a member of General Synod, wrote a letter and he gave to us to publish about this. He said, look, I don't really want to know or care about his personal private life. But here we have someone who's taken a public deliberate stand. Now, what, is, how do you, what do you mean by that? Well, when you give your wedding photos to the Daily Mail and to other newspapers to celebrate this, that's public, okay? When you're making a point about your marriage, when you're going out of town, out of state, out of country to get this marriage performed, you're act and then you're publicizing this in the media, I think it's fair to say that you're an activist. Well, no, so Luke Appleton you, is saying... You are in rebellion against your church. Church of England mm -hmm. doesn't allow for this. You say, I don't care. I'm going to be in rebellion and go to a different uh, diocese or province where I can have this uh, activity blessed. See, so Appleton says, look, he doesn't want to cast any aspersions on Knott's character. Um, uh, we have, you know... It, you never know. I mean, it used to be that being gay sort of tagged you in one particular party line. But in the United States, Don, one of Donald Trump's major supporters and most active guys on TV was Richard Richard Cannell. He's nice. the first gay cabinet min, first gay cabinet minister, uh, ambassador to Germany, head of the national security, director of national intelligence. Uh, he's a gay man, not a, but he is also a virulent pro-Trump guy. So, you know, we don't want to see there's a, there's a one to one uh, connection and not and uh, and Luke Appleton is saying, I again, I'm not saying I assume he's a man of integrity. But we look at the reaction of the gay activists who are over the moon by this. It's proof that the Church of England's going to be changing when they adopt the Lo living love LLF program. So this, I've had more people write to me from England on this one issue over the last day than almost any other issue saying, you've got to cover this. You've got to look into this. And nobody's attacking not as a person, but they're just saying, this is just showing Welby is telegraphing where he's taking the Church of England. He's taking somebody tied into the gay circles, gay culture of the Church of England and putting him in charge of appointments. Mm -hmm. uh, what would that? What does that say about where the future lies? Yep, it. Especially in terms of the upcoming Lambeth, in terms of where the Church of England sits in the leadership of the Anglican Communion, where Justin Welby sits in the leadership of the Anglican Communion, um, do you stay or do you go now to Lambeth? Because, in my mind, at this point. Lambeth has laid out all the cards, not Lambeth, uh, the Church of England has laid out all the cards to what their future looks like. And their future looks like the Episcopal Church in uh, North America here, and Canada, and uh, other places around the world, where they have adopted uh, what the Bible says is not something it can bless. So we just have to uh, see what's going to happen at the Archbishop level here. But unlike the Episcopal Church, the Church of England is much more centralized. Yes, um, you can be run out of town by your bishop. You can you have your life destroyed. Um, here, maybe it's because we're in the boonies. Essentially, I, you know, I see my bishop once every three to four years, and that's fine with me. And I mean, I never I, I get nothing in the mail from New York. I probably do, but I throw it out. But you know, there's nothing. Uh, the, there's no the central authority organs of this of the church have no actual relevance. In other words, uh, Michael Carey gave a speech in front of Lincoln Memorial yesterday on January sixth. Oh, wonderful! An epiphany speech. No, no mention of Jesus Christ. Well, there was. Uh, he did swear a few times, but it was a political speech about. You know, Michael Curry has drunk the Kool Aid about uh, about the a coup attempt, all this and that. Uh, when was he, there a coup he's, attempt? He's, well, Michael, January sixth. Uh, 
when armed white nationalists I don't stormed think the Capitol. Anybody was armed uh, except the Capitol Police, but yeah, far be it from me to say. But Michael, yeah, Michael Curry believes that stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Good for him, but that's the thing. Good for him. I couldn't care less. It doesn't mean anything. Whereas in England, it means a bit more when the Archbishop of Canterbury does something wacky. Uh, well, it's, a, it's a smaller little country. That's got to be a part of the issue over there. Um, and the public library, the Church of England, plays an important part in the culture there because they're part of the Lords. You know, the, and so they do have some, not I'm going to say authority, influence in what happens in the culture there. But it's becoming less and less and less. Thank God, and less. So, but if I'm not mistaken, there's a lot of wars right now between uh, the Church of England bishops and some of their clergy, and we'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about that as well, George. Well, I mentioned we're working on a story, trying to develop it that's taking place in uh, Derby, mm -hmm. but I really want to focus more on actually. Let's go across the border in Wales. Okay. Because that's where the what's where the wars are really popular, or where where have hit, hit the press. Kevin and I before the show prayed for the Church of Wales. We pray for the Church of England. We pray for everybody, and but friends really do pray for the people and the clergy of the Church of Wales because the church is in a bit a bit of a mess. Um, I said the one, two, three, four, five, six bishops in Wales. Five of them are trouble. Uh, well, let, let's just run down the list. The Diocese of uh, Landeff. I hope that's how it's pronounced. It starts with two L's. We can't uh, do Derby so and Derby right. I don't know if we're going to get Landeff either. <laughs> I, think, I think it's supposed to be Flandeff, but yeah. uh, F L L is pronounced F-L, but we'll call it Landeff for our American audience. June Osborne is the bishop there. June Osborne is at war with the dean of her cathedral. And this guy's named Jerwin Capon. Capon, which is a neutered chicken, male chicken. Uh, I don't know whether there's any symbolism in that name. Uh, Capon has been on uh, paid sick leave for about two years. Uh, he, Capon is at war with the chapter of the cathedral who are accusing him of basically embezzling funds to feather his nest. Uh, Capon is also running an antiques business out of his house, the dean, you know, the deanery chapter house. And a re recent uh, QC review uh, by Queen's Council review of the expenses says this guy's like buying $10,000 specialty ovens for the uh, his rectory on the church's dime. So the chapter is at war with the dean. The dean is at war with the bishop. And be over bullying charges, over uh, all these things, <clears throat> and the and the clergy of the diocese are at war with Bishop Osborne, asking that the Archbishop Andy John uh, investigate her for misconduct, bullying, mismanagement, and so on. That's just the diocese of Landeff. Let's move uh, west to Joanna Penberthy in the diocese of Saint David's. Joanna Penberthy was the bishop who, who is noted for her tweets. She's put out thousands of political tweets, and she. Become, she uh, we made her famous too by talking about some of those tweets. She had denounced uh, the the Tories, never, never, never trust a Tory, and all this and that, and was basically hit the big time when the national media and the conservative party nailed her for saying, you know. Talk about Jesus Christ. Don't talk about who you like and dislike in politics. And she really got hammered for this. And there were calls for her to step down. And she took a three-month medical leave, basically, to recover her nerves because she was so traumatized by all this, which in the past meant that she's basically going to get ready to retire. She's gone. She's blown it. She has no credibility. Well, she's back in action. And she may not be as quick to tweet on every issue, but she's out there again. She she hasn't figured it out that she has blown it. And the calls for her to leave were not just, they meant something. So we have the Diocese of St. David's in free fall with the people there who are, that, that elects conservative MPs, the land 
where her diocese is. So she's against the, the political views of her of her people. Let's go uh, over to Andy John, the Archbishop. Of, uh, he's the Bishop of Bangor, Archbishop of Wales, just elected Archbishop of Wales by the other bishops. And there's a problem there with Andy John. He's a personable guy. Uh, he's actually our age, Kevin. He's on the young side for an archbishop. But he has, as the Africans would view it, two wives. Hmm. He's divorced and remarried. He had a wife. He has three children. He divorced her. And he has married one of the female priests in his diocese. I can remember when we started this show, there was a big to-do because the Church in Wales was thinking of having a divorced and remarried bishop. And after great deliberations, they said, I guess we can do it. Well, that guy uh, was bounced out for yeah, he other reasons. Quick, yes. after. Yeah. He left pretty quick. But we've gone from there to saying, okay, it's fine to have a divorced and remarried archbishop. Well, that's not allowed in the Church of England. That's not allowed in the ACNA. That's not allowed in African... There are more divorced and remarried bishops in the Episcopal Church than there are divorced and remarried clergy in all of Africa, except for South Africa. That's a big issue. In fact, I think that's an issue that is more explosive for the African Church than homosexuality. Because, to be frank, homosexuality... The culture in Africa is uh, not welcoming to homosexuality, so it's not something that's out there that is part of their lives. But adultery is an issue. You remember Stanley and Tagali of Uganda, and African bishops get in trouble with girls from time to time. And this is a major issue because they will turn to Scripture and say the Bible says the bishop is a man of one wife. Mm -hmm. How can Andy John hold himself out as an archbishop when he has two wives. Well, the laws of Wales may say he has a single wife because his marriage was dissolved, but he has two in the eyes of the church. So John is now going to be going to his first primates meeting. The other primates won't know this until some mean-spirited fellows in the United States tell them. But this, this is problematic. This is really an issue for them. Mm -hmm. And how will Wellby handle it? By obfuscating, of course, and denying and say, well, you know, Wales gets to do what Wales wants to do. Obviously. And then, well, well, let's keep going. <laughs> uh, Diocese of Monmouth, was, its bishop also went on, a, I think, a year and a half medical leave, mm -hmm. Richard Payne, and nobody knew what it was. And there was rumors in the newspapers about fights between the bishop and his senior clergy. And he finally retired after his 18-month uh, medical leave and the Bishop of Norwich in England did a report into this and found that there was a culture of drinking and swearing and miscommunication and mis and mis uh, malfunction in the upper echelons of the Diocese of Monmouth. It just was a total mess. And it didn't say this outright, but it basically intimated that the Bishop was a mean drunk. And so the Bishop of Wales appointed a new Bishop and now Wales has a lesbian partnered uh, Sherry Van as the Bishop of Monmouth. Gregory Cameron, the Bishop of uh, St. Asaph in the north. Uh, I've known Greg Gregory for we, we 20 years. Yeah, a long time. He's, you know. Gre Gregory just performed a gay wedding for one of his clergy. And in the, his little f sermon that we published parts of on Anglican Inc., he talked about God's love as being... Uh, shown through this same-sex wedding. You know, Gregory's out there with the Kool-Aid. Uh, I mean, wh who do we have left? We had just <laughs> have one. One, one left. <laughs> one left, John Lomas, the new Bishop of Brecon in, South, in Swansea, who we don't know much about him other than that he was in the Navy and he repaired jets, uh, so that's sort of cool. Yeah, but, uh, cool. but he, you know... Maybe the, here's a, and he's considered an evangelical in the Church of Wales, so maybe this is the one safe, normal guy. But the problem we have in the Church of Wales is that Barry Morgan, the former, former archbishop, put all these people in place. From his former chaplain, Jerwin Capon, 
Dean of Landiff to all these uh, women and gay bishops and all this and that. He did everything except for John Lomax. And what do we have now? We have a dysfunctional province that is in free fall in income and attendance and, and seriousness. Now, there are many good clergy in the Church of Wales. There's some wonderful Christian people, but they're not being served well by those who have been placed in authority. And that's the We need to problem. pray that God does something. Yeah, we've this. discussed this uh, in, when Gavin was on the program. The Episcopate in the Church of England is, is rot, rotted to the core. And the problem is they aren't picking Christians, they're picking political middlemen and middle women to run Christian organizations, the, their diocese. And we just watch in free fall now, especially the last 20 years, what's been happening when you elect people who don't have the same faith as you to be your leaders. We're to the point now where, for all intents and purposes, the Church of England is a secular organization. You know, it's not growing. It's not uh, certainly serving uh, the faithful. It's not serving uh, the kingdom. It's not serving the, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's serving itself. It's not just George and Kevin who are saying this. We're having the, the press in England wake up to this. Okay. Simon uh, Jenkins in The Guardian had an article uh, a week or so ago where he basically is saying, look, um, we need to preserve our heritage of these beautiful churches that re represent thousand plus years of English culture and nationhood and not just have the Church of England selling off at a fire sale to turn them into weekend getaway retreats for wealthy city men, but rather, you know, maybe turn them into recreational centers or to community hall. In other words, perhaps the Church of England should take over the, perhaps the English government should take over the management of England's historic buildings and leave the Church of England to basically do its religion business, but allow the cultural fabric of the country to be taken care of by the government because we can't allow what we've had to be lost by the incompetence of the Church of England. And then the Telegraph had an article the other day saying 475 churches closed in the last 10 years. Um, and now part of this is, you know, churches, you know, where we've got rural, rural uh, rectors and vicars with seven or eight churches yeah. um, to cover. Here, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, my goodness me, I'm going to be adding a little mission half hour to my south uh, to my weekend roster. And I think that's a big deal. Well, I know guys that have seven or eight churches and have to go to four or five of them on a weekend. And, and, and you know, some every other Florida. weekend. That's In Florida, there's uh, clergy who have multiple churches. It's not just a foreign problem. We have it here in America, too. Yeah. In, not in the Episcopal Church. I th think of some priests who have two churches, but not seven churches. No, I agree. Uh, well, in England, it's much, much worse. It much, much, much worse. Yeah. Okay, so uh -huh. we talked enough about that. Fun story. Let's do a fun story, George. The Pope says we should not replace children with dogs and cats. That's a fun story. You know, so, uh, yes, I agree that the family structure should be with children, and you should raise your children up to uh, love God and worship Him. Um, and I think dogs and cats and animals are texture to your family not a replacement i find it odd though that the pope doesn't allow uh, or the roman catholic church doesn't allow their clergy to have families if its families are so so important george we didn't do this well francis sure, doing this cold for george uh, francis <laughs> francis is uh is a character yeah I can remember when Francis complained that uh, cats shouldn't breed like rabbits. We should be deliberate in having uh, children. So, Francis, what is it? Uh, we're not to breed like rabbits, but we are not to replace our offspring with rabbits yes. or dogs or cats. Dog cats. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I understand exactly what he's saying, and that uh -huh. it, it for older people in Florida. Unless we have some Abraham and Sarah issues, I don't think uh, 
that the dog is a replacement for a child because that time of life has passed. But people are delaying marriage. Mm -hmm. It's a major problem in Italy. It's a major problem in Italy of delayed marriage and people having... Italy has re fallen below replacement level in domestic births. Italians are not having children. Uh, so, Italian, you know, in the United States, the old slur against uh, Italian immigrants was they breed like rabbits and whatnot. Now, in Italy, they don't breed at all. Um, just the way of demographics. So the Pope is talking about the demographic winter coming that is facing Europe, where Europe's young adults are not marrying, not settling down, not having children, and they're uh, we're seeing the Paris Hilton types spending tens of thousands of dollars on their little Lhasa Apsa or Shih Tzu well, rather than raising a family. This is something Jill and I witnessed in our neighborhood back in Connecticut in the 90s and early 2000s is people would buy the dog and they would treat that dog better than their children. They would come home and spend you know half an hour walking the dog after work and the dog would get the best meal, the dog would get the, the, the groomed on the weekend um, and the kids they just sent off to school and sent off to play dates and stuff like that and they, they serve the dog more as uh, something in the family than they serve their kids. And, you know, that's something we just watched happening in, in our little, you know, uh, middle-income neighborhood that people love their dogs more than any other part of the family. And so I see that kind of uh, even to a greater extent here in uh, this retirement community where people walk their dogs in strollers, George. You know, the, my next door neighbors will put a little uh, Fido in a stroller and push him around our, our little uh, half mile circle here. Yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not there yet. <laughs> but I do think uh, animals are a great texture and uh, add content and uh, uh, value to a family. But uh, they are not replacement for children in any way, shape, or form. All right, George, this has been the first show of the year. Do we get all the news? No, but we got all the ones that we're competent to talk that's about so right. far tonight. That's good. And we're both tired. George just went through Christmas season and Advent season. Um, he's going to be a little tired uh, sitting here in front of the program for our first of the year. Um, we're, we're still moving into the camper here. Um, for those of you who know about Skylar, Skylar died this week, and so we had to make arrangements. It's You can't just bury the cat out back here when you live in an RV resort. You have to take him to a a vet and have her cremated and uh you know just crazy times as we start our new show for 2022 thank you for watching our program i'm kevin colson and i'm george conger and you've been watching episode 709 of anglican unscripted mm -hmm.